Yes, we, 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 we can start now, yes, definitely. Okay. Let me first uh, uh, introduce Professor Shi. It's uh, our honor to have Professor Shi here to give us an invited talk here. So Professor uh, Chikang Shi is, uh, has been a faculty member at the physics department of University of Texas at Austin since 1990. He received his PhD degree in applied physics from Stanford University in 1988. He worked at IBM Watson Lab as a postdoc before joining the UT Austin as a faculty member in January 1990. He was a holder of the Jean and Roland Blumberg Professor of Physics from 2004 to 2014, and has been a holder of Arnold Romberg Endowed Chair in Physics since 2014. Professor Shi is a fellow of APS. He received the Distinguished Alumina Award, National Tsinghua University, Taiwan, in 2011. He is also a recipient of the Yushan Scholar awarded by the Ministry of Education, Taiwan. Professor Shi has been a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the CNMS, Oak Ridge National Life, US. He has also served on the Advisory Board for the Institute of Physics, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. Uh, state is yours, Professor Shi. Thank you, uh, Weibo. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. And as you can tell that I have a close connection to Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> so next time when I, I go to Taiwan almost every summer uh, until the, the, the pandemic uh, start. And hopefully next time if I go to Taiwan and I will have a chance to go visit you guys in person. Great, great. Okay. Looking forward to meeting you in person in Singapore. Yeah. And thank you for the invitation. I have been Singapore only once for a conference, maybe five years ago, also on the 2D material. And, uh, and, and uh, but didn't have a chance to see much of the Singapore. Yeah. Anyway, so let me start. Uh, so the topic is uh, 2D electronic materials and their uh, heterostructure. So I will, you know, I will try to first describe using as how to, you know, describe the, the first topic is how to correctly measure the quasi-particle band structure in 2D material. This is not a trivial task, so even though most people think, oh, you just take the STM, then you should be able to measure this correctly. Then I will focus on the, uh, the subject of so-called cur current topic of Moray super lattices. I will first talk about uh, using STM to look at the uh, TMD heterostructure through the lens of Moray pattern using STM and the uh, spectroscopy. Then I will link the, this uh, Moray super lattice to the current topic of so-called Moray excitons. They include the interlayer and interlayer Moray excitons. And this is still a very, very hot topic right now, okay? So I cannot, if you really look like, you go, go to the APS March meeting, there will be so many talks related to this and very difficult to, to keep up with. But I hope what we've done, you know, will, will indeed provide some insight to this topic. Then I will talk about, if I have time, we will see, right? How, how many minutes do I have, 50 or one hour? Uh, one hour, roughly, yeah. Okay, so, so then I will, uh, if, if I could, then I will bring the topic of so-called how do you tune the interlayer coupling instead of just a just twist angle to use a hydrostatic pressure, you ended up can change the interlayer coupling strings by almost a threefold. Okay, now we got into this 2D material first by this topic. So in the 2D electronic material, because of this extreme atomic geometry, the first issue get a lot of people's attention is theoretically, there is a remarkably large exciton binding energy. And this work was done like uh, in, in the, by Stephen Lewis, the theoretical calculation in 2013 and found this quasi-particle band gap is about one EV above a uh, larger than what people measure using the PL. 
And that really stimulate a lot of uh, thinking research activity in this area. Now, there's a, there's a very easy uh, explanation for this. That is, if you really think out in a bulk material, right? You, X tongue is like a, is like a one hole, one electron, they bind together. And the binding energy, you can just think about using the hydrogenic model. You have all learned that the dielectric environment really cut down this so-called energy scale quite a lot. And so for the bulk 3D exciton binding, the usually in the, the, the energy scale is roughly a few MeV MOs, just one to five MeV. But now if you think about in the, in the extreme geometry, now, if we have a, an electron and a hole, the Coulomb interaction between them, this Coulomb field go into the vacuum. So, so that means you have the loss of the screening. The loss of screening actually increase the exciton binding energy. So previously, if you think about it, the hydrogen atom have a, a very, very large binding energy, but it was really cut down by the dielectric environment. But now once you bring it to such an extreme geometry, then this Coulomb screening is cut down of course, tremendously. And the very large exciton binding energy give, uh, can have many important implications, right? For example, you, can, you should be able to see, say like exciton condensate at much higher temp temperature. Now the, the point is then how do you measure it, right? So if we really think about a quasi-particle band gap, the quasi-particle band gap is like a single particle. Like where is where is the energy level that you add one electron? That is your the minimum energy is, is located at conduction band minimum, and then the energy level where you extract one electron out, and that is the valence band maximum. So that's a so-called single particle. Now, because exciton is sort of the electron and hole binded, then you can see now this will be the binding energy, and then you can see the first exciton transition, and then you should be able to see also all those exciton reaper series. And indeed, these ha are, have been seen, right? So how do you probe the quasi-particle band structure? So this is the, 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 the most straightforward thing is let's just go ahead and use the RPAS, right? In result photo emission spectroscopy measure the energy versus K and you can map out the whole band structure. But the RPAS usually let you measure only the, the valence band. So this has been mapped out in this paper in 2014. Then the question is, where is the conduction band minimum? After all, you need to know what is a quasi-particle band gap. And then the difference between a quasi-particle band gap and your exciton, the first exciton transition, that is your exciton binding energy. So this group, is uh, this is a Zia Chance group at, at Stanford, then use the typical trick that almost every uh, APAS uh, group use that let's dope it with some alkali metal. And after you dope it, you can move the Fermi energy to the conduction band minimum, but you can dope it just right above it because above, you cannot dope much more, much more than that, right? So then they see, wow, the band gap is only 1.5 AeV in the MOSE2, while the optical transition is 1.65 EV. You cannot have negative X non-binding energy. So that really give rise to this first very intriguing phenomenon in the 2D say, well, not only the X non-binding energy going to be influenced by its environment, also the quasi-particle band structure can also be influenced by the environment. And this is what they call band gap renormalization issue. So this, this presents some challenge, okay? Now, now you think about, well, simple, let's just go ahead and use the STM, right? Because STM, you either extract an electron out from the valence band or you add an electron in and you measure precisely the quasi particle band gap. Okay, so we did this in 2014, and then we measure quasi-particle band gap of the MOS2, and we find out it's about 2.15 EV. 
But if we use this 2.15 EV, and then we also measure optical gap, which is this is a PL, is the same sample, not necessarily the same flake, but it's sort of the same genetic sample. And then the sample, we, we also measure the PL. Then the exon binding energy is large, but a lot smaller than what originally theoretically predicted. Yeah. So when we publish this and then the, 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 the referee said, well, but you have this other threshold. Maybe what you hear, this is dopamine induced, like a, a bend narrowing, got nothing to do with this uh, truly quasi particle. So we leave it to say, well, we still insist this is where the band gap is, the, the connection band minima, but we leave a possibility. So this become like almost a, a chip on the shoulder. I have to prove that I, I was right. And then at the same time, the Berkeley group, all right, uh, they published this paper about six months after us. They measured the MOSE2. And because it's the same sample that ZXN used to measure the RPAS. So what they have seen is then they can compare the energy location with the RPAS measurement. They found out that this peak is usually is where the gamma point energy peak. And then this one, that in your typical uh, tolerance spectroscopy, you usually don't see it until, for example, if you use a logarithmic scale, and you will see this extra shoulder and they assign that to the, this is to be the valence band. And that they can determine the quasi-particle band gap precisely. In that case for MOS E2, they found the exon binding energy is about 0.55 EV. So there have been a lot of debate is who is correct, who, you know, but this is the case say, well, not every sample you can have simultaneously RPAS and the STM to look at it. And second, how do I know that this is enough dynamic range? How do I know there's not another state below it? And then the other one is say, well, but this, they put it on the uh, graphene substrate. How do I know how this is not coming from the graphene, right? If you don't have the RPAS to compare. So we came out with a scheme to, to to, to probe the, the quasi-particle band gap. The challenge to use the scanning tolerance spectroscopy is the dynamic range. I'm gonna use this example, say you have single layer of WSE2. The effect is quite dramatic, right? So if I take a typical tolerance spectroscopy, this is a DIDV in the linear scale that I look at it, then you would have usually would assign from here to here, this would be the band gap. And in fact, this was in early day, almost everybody assigned that as the band gap. If you assign that as a band gap, they indeed, all the excellent binding energy would be around one EV. Right? But that is not the correct location of the band threshold. For connecting band, it is, but for the valence band, it turns out, this case, the, the valence band maximum is quite a lot, significantly higher than what you usually observe right here. But how do I know that? You prove it. So what, I, what we, we first proved this by, by taking, uh, taking a tunneling spectroscopy, say in your typical tip to sample distance, then we, after interrupt, we artificially put the tip closer by three and a half n strength. Then in that case, when we look at, look at the tunneling spectroscopy, so what used to be here, this is sharp, now it's become a shoulder, then there is another shoulder coming in. But how do I know that this is not, a, not the, the, the underlying graphite? Well, if I look at a graphite, this is what I observe. If I put my tolerance bias inside the gap, then this is what I observe by seeing through the WSC2. So we know this is a graphite. And then up to here, then there's other threshold turn on. Say, so, well, then it's clear that this will be where the onset of the valence band uh, maximum location. And let me go ahead and, and, and skip this one and say, well, but why that is so? If when we do the tunneling spectroscopy, you, we usually think about tunneling probability is exponential dependence on this uh, so-called uh, uh, decay constant, which is kappa n times the 
the, the tip to sample distance, okay? And typically this decay constant, you can write it as proportional to the square root of the barrier height. But this is, this is true only if you don't have parallel momentum, okay? I will use this free electron model first as an illustration because this for most of the time, that's easier for the student to understand. So if you think about you have, now you have an electron coming out that with a parallel momentum, but only the kinetic energy along the perpendicular direction, that is one can penetrate through this barrier. Right? And the parallel, because parallel momentum need to be conserved and that ended up going into the, the decay constant with this formula. And if the K parallel is not really that large, it's just not a big deal, right? A typical tunneling decay constant is one inverse angstrom. But in the case of the transition metal dichocarginide or graphene, you're, 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 you say in transition metal dichocarginide, your valence band maximum is at a K point, and that is about 1.3 inverse angstrom. That turns out to be very, very large. So if you take that, the difference is delta K, delta kappa is about 0.8, okay, inverse in strong. And that really will overwhelm uh, to, to make that you have a difficulty to detect that. So when I gave this explanation uh, in a conference and then one, one researcher from Germany and then said, well, the, you got to realize this band structure is not free electron. This is a block state. And it's, it's an excellent question, right? But if you go to the original Tersov's formalism published in PIL, you'll find out this K-parallel comes in exactly like what I described here. And this is the reason, because if you think about the block state, then you can decompose them into the superposition of free electron, different free electron state with like a Wunklan process, adding some uh, like a reciprocal lattice vector, right? And that, that will give you the state at that K, that block state. But think about it, it's any other component other than the first Brown zone will always add it up to outside the first Brown zone. So that part of component make an even larger K pair on. Right? So that you will see that probability drop even lower. So that is one uh, reason try to, I don't know if this, if, if, if you will get it, what happened, how to extend it into the true block state. But if you cannot, then that's all right. Just think about this almost like free electron, then you will be able to see that is the reason why. Now this is present a problem, like we cannot do every, every sample and we do this and interrupt it and push it in many and strong and then and try to measure it. So we came up with a scheme, what we call the constant current towering spectroscopy. So let me try to use this as an example. Say if you have a, have a WSE2, okay, then you think about this is a genetic band structure. If your tip bias is right at here, right? Your, if your tip Fermi level is right there, then you are extracting electron from the valence band then because the gamma point has a low K parallel, so your tunneling probability really dominated by the state near the gamma point. Only when you pass that, that the state in the gamma no longer available, then you start picking up the state near the K point. So if you put the constant tunneling current, then your tip to sample distance is gonna adjust itself closer to pick up the stay here because now the kappa is a lot larger. So it will automatically reduce the Z to pick up the stay. Then after you finish this, then you pass through the variance bank maximum. Then the tip will push further in to pick up a stay from the underlying graphite. So if you do that, then you can use the lock in amplifier to look at the IPV and that give you roughly around the density of state. It look like this. Then you will see this kind of this step. If you reflect it in, you plot it at the Z dV, then you will see this sharp dip. That's when you pass through the gamma point. 
then go back go back up here, then have another threshold here is at the K point. Now, because you pass through, because when you pass through the K point, you start sensing, you start sensing the, the state from the from the underlying graphite. So this transition is a smoother, unlike the state at the gamma point, which is very sharp. Then if at the same time you measure the tunneling decay coefficient, then indeed at this at the gamma point, you have a you have a smallest uh, uh, kappa value. And then when you go up near the K point, then your kappa value will, will increase. Now here, because now you have the state from the, the, the graph from the graphite, and then it's sort of the superposition of the two and this transition transition to the graphite uh, tunneling coefficient. Okay. So then we can use then you know theoretical simulation, and then indeed it replicated what we observe experimentally very well. So that kind of established the credibility of this. That now we can measure the different critical point in the Brown zone. But this is not the quasi-particle interference that many people are familiar with. Say, well, you can have a K resolution in tunneling spectroscopy. Those is due to the quasi-particle interference, but here is due to the K parallel dependent of the tunneling coefficient. So it's more indirect. And by using this, we measure the, the one for WSC2 and also measure the one for MOSC2 and then this is what we have observed. Similar behavior you can use to describe the behavior at the conduction band. In the conduction band, we can determine what's the threshold of this the, at the K point, another threshold at the Q point. And then you can see the evolution of this KQ uh, transition in as a function of uh, at, for these four different transition metal uh, And then one very interesting phenomenon is it seems at the WSE2 that this Q point and K point are nearly degenerate. And we even argue that Q point may be slightly below the K point. And this is still, a lot of people have debate on this. Uh, some say that indeed, you know, supporting that the Q point is lower than the K point, but this is not that uh, critical for at this moment. Now, you would say, well, these, I, as I indicated, that is a indirect method, right? So now I'm going to give you a more direct method that is using a time result, angle result for the electron spectroscopy. Um, it is a very complicated procedure, but the basic idea is you use a laser pump to excite the state into the conduction band and use another probe to then excite it, the, the, the state that you pump into the conduction band and then you detect them. And I won't go into the detail, just try to tell you that indeed we achieved this. And then we measure the quasi-particle tunneling gap. This is where the valence band maximum location is. And this is the conduction band minimum location. And you can see the temperature dependent and at, at 80 K Kelvin, we measure the gap about 2.1 EV. Remember I indicated our first measurements for using a tunneling spectroscopy is about 2.15. I would say within the experimental error, the two are very consistent. Of course, time result up has, in fact, it's really created many body states. So it is far more complicated than the tunneling uh, spectroscopy. Nevertheless, in this ton and in this time result tunneling spectroscopy, we can see the K point right here. This one is the Q point, although people in photo emission like to call this a sigma point, and the difference is about 0.2 EV. And that is precisely what we see in the towering spectroscopy. All right, so that just tell you how you measure the, the, the quasi-particle band gap uh, precisely. Now I'm going to quickly go through this part. Some of you may have already heard this, uh, that is the Moray pattern. And then Moray pattern is occur for, if you have a, like a lattice mismatch system, then even if the two are well aligned, you're gonna create a Moray pattern due to this geometric interference. And then you can also have a lateral heterojunction. And in this case, this is a lateral heterojunction. 
in on the top. And then the, the, the core is the same as the substrate. You see no Mori pattern. And then this MOS2 sh show the Mori pattern, but because of the strain created with forming this lateral heterostructure, the Mori pattern truthfully respond and show this distorted uh, Mori pattern. All right. I'm going to skip this part because of the time, but uh, I think Mori pattern is such a uh, hot topic. Probably most everyone knows about it. The only thing that I want to point here is if you take a very uh, a nearly lattice match system, right? You try to create a Mori, Mori pattern. Is periodicity is extremely sensitive to the twist angle. But if you choose the one that was a larger lattice mismatch, then this dependence, more periodicity dependence on the twist angle is a lot slower. And this is responsible for, I believe, this very sensitive uh, uh, dependence with the twist angle is largely responsible for why in the MOS2, SE2, WSE2, Moray exciton, there's still controversial, controversy behind it. All right, now let's look at the, the in the, uh, when you have a head of structure, right? First, you can assume these two electronic structure for this two constituents, just like independent uh, electronic structure. But that cannot be true. Otherwise, the monolayer transition to the bilayer cannot have this direct gap to indirect gap uh, transition. This happened is because of interlayer coupling, say in the gamma point, which is very large, and then split the, 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 the state at the gamma point and push the variance band maxima above the K point. So you're going to see the, 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 the interlayer coupling is cannot be ignored. And this, but on the other hand, you can understand the interlayer coupling if you take the monolayer as a constituent and you give the K conservation, right? How the thing align. And if you choose at any one point, say the state in one and state in the other one, and then put it, then you can use this like a hydrogen molecule model or any kind of molecule model, and then they couple, they form the bonding state and the bonding state. And that is really this two level model for the interlayer coupling. And almost everything can be understood that way. Now let's look at this first uh, Mori pattern being observed in the transition metal dichocarge line. So this is one we seen in 2017 and MOS2 has about 4% smaller lattice constant on WSE2. And you will see this Mori pattern very nicely. And then the periodicity is 8.7 nanometer is precisely if you assume they have a rigid rotation, like they don't have any reconstruction then you will ex you expect to see this 8.7 nanometer. But there's also an, an ambiguity is whether they are zero degree or they are 60 degree, gonna give you the same uh, periodicity. So we use the, the, the CS correct TM to later on confirm what we observe is the, what we call R stacking. That means it's zero degree. Now, we observe such a large corrugation and the, the, you, you, you will see that, now let's, let's say what is the stacking, right? Which is the, is the so we can say the, the point where we see the bright spot, that is the AA stacking. The AA stacking means the two in the lateral part, they are exactly one on top of each other. This is what we call the AA stacking. AB stacking is just like what you do in the ABC stacking type. And then one is shifted toward the diagonal direction about you know, one third of the lattice constant. And that is what we call uh, the AB stacking. And we compare with the DFT calculation. Of course, DFT calculation had to do some kind of approximation and play a lot, all different kind of trick. 
And the conclusion is in the AA stack part, you have the largest interlayer spacing in the ABSE means we are MOS2 look down and we, the hole that we see is selenium in the bottom. So that's what we call the ABSE. And this will be the closest one. And in the bridge side, then it's intermediate. In the ABW, it will be the shortest. So you compare this one, then you say, wow, the two agree so well. I was shocked, right? How can, you know, DFT predict the thing so precisely? So we were happy and published this, uh, this result. Okay. But we noticed that in the theoretical calculation, the modulation amplitude should only be about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 angstrom, while in reality, we'll observe is more than 1.5 angstrom. But STM is just the measure of the electronic structure, so it always convoluted with the electronic effect. We are happy. So we say, well, the, the two agree so well. Then we come and do the towering spectroscopy at this four different site. And again, play the trick that we did that we can measure where is the threshold, then we can measure where the gamma threshold, where the case threshold is, all right? And then, okay, so you measure it. Then I want you, I want to bring your attention. I bring the attention to you like in this AA stacking that we measure the gamma and the K separation. So in the MOSC2, MOS2, WSC2 is a type two a band alignment. And then most of the band, uh, variance band state are coming from WSC2. Then you see this separation change quite a lot from AA to AB side to bridge side to ABW side. And let's now look at, this is the experimental result. This is what we see. And theoretically, this is what you see, the separation between gamma and K. And I was astonished with this calculation result. Say, how can, because we did the experiment first and and, and DFT, you cannot fudge because everyone can check, right? So in the DFT calculation, you go to all different group, any reputable group will give you identical result. So this is what we got. And then we, we also measure the band gap variation. And this is what DFT calculation will show you that indeed there is a band gap variation, although DFT shows a smaller band gap variation, but just a tiny little uh, uh, smaller. The variation is slightly smaller, but the absolute amplitude is a lot smaller. So this, but they all, this is a typical, we all know that DFT is a limitation. But to understand why you have such a variation, then there is a, this a simple two level model that I described earlier. Let's just think about before they couple, this will be the variance band location in the gamma, and the variance band location in the K. Now, when the two, that's first ignore the KK coupling because that's a lot smaller. Let's just look at the gamma gamma coupling. So if the coupling strength larger, then you will push this guy up and push this one down more. Now, if you will now imagine, okay, that so if the coupling is stronger, in fact, you're going to result in a smaller energy separation between gamma and K. If coupling is smaller, you're going to have a larger. Now let's look at when we when we look at the a different side. AA side is where the the two layer has larger uh, spacing. So you can you expect to have a smaller uh, gamma gamma coupling, and indeed smaller gamma gamma coupling will result in a larger separation between gamma and K. And that explained the whole result quite nicely. So we're quite happy. And then we also say, well, then we further prove that this, even after the interlayer coupling, this heterobilayer remain a direct gap uh, material. And so you can also map out the, the, the whole 2D electronic structure, unfortunately at the time, we really cannot compare with the DFT because DFT cannot really calculate such a large unicell. So 
it's but the the tunneling spectroscopy showed this very pretty 2D electronic super lattice. All right. So now uh, this was done in January 2017. Then because of this remain the direct gap, band gap. So there is an implication of Moray exoton, which I will come back to talk about it. Now let's look at the, the, the lateral heterojunction. So, so if you think about the lateral heterojunction, so in this case, we have a WSE2 as a core, MOS2, that is the skirt. Then in this, in this paper that we show say, well, the WS2 and MOS2 appear to be chemically abrupt because WS2 is higher, MOS2 is uh, smaller uh, thickness, and then electronic structure-wise, the MOS. So, so if you if you look at the the the, the valence band structure, then you're going to see the WS2 going to show up much uh, brighter by about one inverse, uh, one angstrom height higher. So you can see quite a few straight section, but on here, we constantly see this tiny little kind of absorbate right there. And our understanding at that time say, well, this is just some kind of uh, absorbate we couldn't get rid of because this is a CVD sample and you take it in UHV or NEO and some absorbate still got to remain. And I don't have a time probably to describe this, but this as turns out, that's where the misfit dislocation is. And misfit dislocation is more closer to metallic and that's where the absorbate is. Now let's zoom in and to look at the, the structure and you'll see uh, this is not atomic image. This is really the, uh, this is really the, uh, the so-called moray pattern between the uh, the TMD and the graphite. So the periodicity is about one, uh, uh, one nanometer. But the moray pattern shows almost perfect interface. That implies an almost perfect interface atomically. Okay. And, and that you say, well, okay, this is what I expected. This is a pseudomorphic strain over there. But if we cal but we can calibrate it, okay, in, in the direct image, you may not see that very clearly, but if you calibrate it, we see hmm, that from here to here for the MOS2, that the, the, the lattice constant doesn't seem to, to get stretched. You know, here is will be 4%, right? Okay, they must, so therefore, they must be strained at the interface and go further. We'd like to know what is the behavior of that strain. The, the formation of Moray pattern does provide some amplification uh, factor. So you can see if you have lattice mismatch about four, 4%, four then your Moray pattern will be about 25 times of your uh, real lattice. So now let's look at this one say, well, okay, you have this, MOS2, WSE2, uh, heterostructure, lateral heterostructure sitting on the WSE2 here, you don't see Mori pattern, clear. But here, the Mori pattern gets stretched. But the stretch is amplified, is an amplification of the lattice mismatch. So therefore, by looking at the Mori pattern, compare that to the strain-free one, we, can actually determine it, what is the strain tensor here. So the diagonal element and the off-diagonal element can all be determined. So the off-diagonal element, of course, is the shear strain. So in here, this also makes sense because if you think about it, if it, if the if the in order to maintain this uh, coherent strain at the interface, then the MOS two will have to be stretched in parallel to this interface. But as a result, a perpendicular to this interface, the thing will be compressed. And then since the strain is going to have a gradient, automatically there will be a shear strain to come with it. And I won't go into the detail, but using this, 
Mori pattern, you can actually determine the strain tensor very precisely. So in this case, you can even determine the strain, the change of the lattice constant as high as 0.05%. And the reason you can have such a high precision is not because STM give you that such a high precision. The STM will give you about one to 2% precision is because there's this amplification factor of the Moray pattern. And that is one give rise to uh, this high precision to determine the strain. And the strain of course is have uh, impact on the electronic structure. And then you can see the MOS2, now you can see the band gaps go narrow, narrow and not narrower. And then we can determine what is the band gap as a function of the strain, uh, narrowing as a function of strain. But what I want to show you is, is right at the interface, we observe this very interesting phenomenon. If you look at the MOS2 and WSC2, the conduction band uh, state, then you will see, yeah, conduction band minimum of the WSC2 is above the MOS2. This is what everyone expected from the band structure uh, calculation. And then in the valence band, what I show here, this is really the WSC2 and MOS2. This, the bright signal right here is the gamma point. And then the K point of the WSE2 and the gamma point is about 0.6 EV apart. And but for for the for the MOS2, it is only about 0.2. So this would almost imply there should be about 0.4 EV band offset with the MO with the WSE2 about MOS2. But turns out you have this strain induced interface state. And that pulled this up and changed what used to be a type two interface. In this case, become a type one interface. Okay, type one band offset. So that's kind of interesting. So this paper uh, later we published just, you know, pretty much describe what uh, you, how can you did use the, the Mori pattern to, to map out the 2D strain tensor and also its impact on the electronic structure. It turns out the strain can be also as another tuning knob to control the Mori x -top. I have about another 15 minutes, so that's enough for me to, to talk about Mori x -ton. So as we indicated in that uh, 2017 uh, uh, paper, say, well, there is a band gap modulation. So now you can imagine, right? If there is a band gap modulation, then you're going to see the electron confinement, hole confinement, right? This is just a, just a schematic. It doesn't mean they will align exactly at the same physical location, but just imagine this is the case. Now you have this type two uh, alignment. So the band gap that I described is really for the electron in the MOS2 and hole in the WSC2. So this will be the interlayer exciton. This is a band structure. And then if you take this quasi-particle band structure and then subtract the exciton binding energy, that will be your interlayer uh, exciton transition energy. Now imagine that this would almost behave like the, there will be a confinement. So this almost like you have a regular array of circular shaped quantum dot, exciton quantum dot. And it has going to have a very interesting implication in making like a, a single photon source or entangled, entangled photon pair. And this was my original interest. But turns out, okay, there are a lot of uh, very interesting aspect of Moray exciton that we didn't perceive the time when we saw the, this uh, Moray super lattice. And that is discussed in these two uh, important paper. One is by my colleague, Mac Alan McDonald. The other one is by my friend, uh, uh, Wen Yao. And uh, Alan's is a paper talk primarily intralayer exciton and while Wen Yao's the, the paper talk about both interlayer and intralayer exitons. 
And both paper focus on this aspect of so-called topological axonic band structure. Interesting, right? Because this two paper talk about Moray exoton. Their scientific interest is focusing on the topological exotonic band structure so far, despite so many papers published in nature, okay, in all nature physics, none has yet touched this aspect of topological exotonic band structure. And maybe because the energy scale is difficult to observe and difficult to manipulate. And it also underlies the difficult to have very reduced way to make this uh, more super lattice based on the heterobi layer. So in 2019, these four paper published in the same issue in Nature. Okay, so this is a, amazing, right? Nature can publish four paper on the same issue, all talk about this more exoton. And some of them, these, are, these two are the same, but they have different, they report different results. And these two, uh, WS2 and WSE2, and WS2, MOSE2, these two are lattice mismatch system. These two are lattice match system. Then later on, you can also see there is another paper published about using this Moray super lattice as a Hubble model, a quantum simulator for Hubble model. This paper also published in Nature. Right, uh, you know, the, this, this is the reason why I say, well, the, the whole the whole Nature Journal almost got overwhelmed by everything related to Moray. Okay, so I, I, won't, I won't go into detail uh, about uh, what has been reported in that 2019. I only want to bring two papers. They talk about the same system. And both of them are my friend, all right? But their conclusion are against each other. So the first one is by Xiaodong Xu's group. And then they, their observation is they observed this sharp structure and proved the concept that they behave, they behave almost like uh, extant quantum dot. And Xiaodong's group then go and again, measure Zeeman effect and measure the, the G factor and then everything agree with the theory quite nicely. One important aspect is they, they, their conclusion, the confinement potential is very weak, only 10 to 20 EV. And this is why in that time, when they observed this, it's difficult to find the uh, anti-bunching signal. But now uh, by a, a Japanese group, they have been seeing in the, the anti-bunching sort of single photon source uh, based on more exoton has now been observed. But you know, all of this more exoton, early more exoton study, there's no, because when you fabricate it, there's no direct structural confirmation. All right. Then this is by Elaine's group, and then study the same system, okay? And they observe very different phenomena. And their conclusion is this moray potential is rather deep and resulting in this multiple level confinement, all right? At this moment, I still cannot say who is correct, even three years after this. And there is a reason behind why in this MOSC2, WSC2 system, different group is gonna give you totally different result. Well, all right, the, you know, so so the 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 pro, the difficulty here is 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 in this nearly lattice mismatch system. The detail, fine detail, of the Moray structure determines so strongly on your position you can make in twist angle, or if you have twist angle uh, 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 disorder, and that answer that that question is partially answered by this paper in nature material where they have discovered and this was also the time when i visited columbia to give my to, to give my talk ape show me say and i say well there's no direct confirmation any of these optical measurement no direct confirmation of the structure of moray moray pattern and he pulled out this this 
preliminary result and show it to me. Say, Ken, let me show you. We seem to have seen this, right? Not everything can be done in UHV STM, right? But this one is you can then just use a piezo force uh, microscopy and then you can measure this thing when it's uninsulated because when you do optical spectroscopy, the sample need to be fabricated on insulator. And lo and behold, he showed me this PFM measurement with a phase contrast. He can see more pattern and then discover this more pattern vary from location to the location, even for your best intention, try to control the twist angle. There are a lot of twist angle disorder and that gives rise to totally different uh, results. So that partially explained, but still is the more is the more potential deep or not? That's that part is still not answered. Right. Then uh, later on, we apply this uh, PFM. Uh, this was done primarily by my colleague, uh, 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 KG Lai, and to also measure this more pattern when they are on insulator. And uh, Elaine used this technique to end it up looking at the very interesting interface uh, phonon and see this beautiful phonon reorganization. And since this is uh, her work, I won't say much, you know, I'm only happy I'd be part of it. Okay, so in that paper, it also said, well, for a low twist angle, you're going to have this 3D reconstruction. So basically what this means is locally, right? If you are rigid, then you will see a very regular uh, Moray pattern, but somehow, if locally, if they are slight or deviated from this so-called perfect, uh, like Brunel stacking, or Brunel stacking is sort of edge stacking or the R stacking, they want to locally push them so they become a commensurate. So the, in some sense, like locally, this part being pushed to a commensurate structure and then the accumulated the mismatch and they get just pop it right at this interface from all those sharp lines and then accumulated over here. But if the twist angle is large, then, you know, there's such a, such a, uh, a large 3D reconstruction is no longer favorable. And therefore it is believed the rigid approximation will be a good approximation. And that is also why in the in the in the large mismatch system, it seems the Mori pattern, is, the reproducibility of producing the Mori pattern is a lot higher. But I want to say, is that true? Okay, so that go into my last topic. Okay, so this is the work that I have collaboration with Wen Hao, and uh, for the audience. So so please keep this part more confidential. We are wrapping this paper up. Okay and should be submitted very soon. So this is uh, a paper that I should give uh, a tribute, the main credit to Wen Hao. So he had come up with this method that you can use the CBD to grow uh, MOS2 was highly oriented. The angular distribution and dispersion is about three degree, okay? Now he can then also take a grow, a CBD grow a very, very large MOS E2. And he just exfoliated once stacking. So in one stacking, he can create about 20 more super lattice with different twist angle and different orientation. So either edge stacking or R stacking. And this method allow us to create a very large ensemble with only a few fabrication. And that is quite important because most of the Moray uh, Extant study just come out here and give you a couple of twist angle, okay? And then if it's only a few twist angle, then you can then go there and argue what would be the, what does this Moray Extant correspond to? But there's not really a very systematic uh, investigation, but this way it will allow us to see them systematically then we observe the interlayer exciton. So in this case, as a function of the, of the twist angle, so large twist angle, they, they behave just like a isolated system. And then we go to the small twist angle, then Mori pattern shows up. 
and then uh, then you will then you will see this uh, a change of the interlayer exciton, and due to the periodicity change. So then when the periodicity change, even with the same moray potential depth, the confinement change. And you can measure the interlayer exciton here, and this is the intralayer exciton. So now if you look at plot them as a function of twist angle, this is for MOSE2, intralayer exciton, this is for interlayer exciton. Then you can fit, try to come up with a model, take what would be the moray potential. So the moray potential, when I try to say this would be the moray potential and then uh, amplitude. If you use this, and then you, you find out you need to fit the moray potential depth all around 100 to 150 MeV in order to fit the data. Now, but if you take the DFT calculation, the interlayer moray exciton, the interlayer moray potential is indeed about 100 MeV. So, you know, in, in our 2017 paper, we already compared that, but we measure this moray potential amplitude. This is the band gap variation about 150 MeV. And then here, the, and then we also show that DFT give you an amplitude about 100 MeV. And this is very similar system, right? The only difference is now is MOST2 instead of WSC2. So you see this, but the intralayer is very small. And you go to go to any DFT group, they will tell you this is a small. But why do we see such a large variation intralayer exiton? Not only that, if you do the absorption spectroscopy, you will be able to measure the intralayer exciton excited state. So you do this kind of absorption spectroscopy, then you see all different kind of level as a function of the angle. Then you measure it, and these are these level. And it turns out you can fit it. So this is sort of, you know, the fact that you can see multiple branches, that means confined exciton. These are confined exciton in the very deep moray potential for intralayer exciton. But the DFT only shows such a small confinement. Where could it go wrong, right? Remember, in our paper in 2017, we said, well, everything seems to agree with the DFT calculation. And that, to me, is really quite, a, quite astonishing. When we compare that, we compare this to interlayer spacing. And then we say, well, at least the qualitative, the, the, the trend looks exactly the same. So there's no reason why for that for us to, 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 to doubt the DFD result. Until then, 2000, at the end of 2021, I saw this other STM paper, okay? So this paper is very interesting. It look at is WSE2 on WS2. So very similar to what we have, except here is WS2. But in terms of lattice mismatch, it's about the same, right? It's the two you can say, the only difference is here you have WSE2 on top. Here you have a WSE2 on bottom. You look at that STM image. It's, you may say, well, what's wrong? You see more pattern, you see more periodicity. But turns out the contrast is reverse, exactly reverse of what we observe. Why both our experimental data, both cannot be lying, but why just by flipping one upside down, you see such a large contrast. So this is from the Berkeley group. So I bet when they saw this, they couldn't, they couldn't explain it because in their DFG calculation, original DFG calculation, the interlayer spacing separation is precisely what we thought it would be in what we interpret in our 2017 paper. But then they allow somehow, they say, well, then there is some kind of relaxation, even for this large lattice mismatch system. So in that cal calculation said there is some kind of 3D in the third, third dimension, there's additional reconstruction. So as a result, even at AA side, you have large interlayer spacing, but the strain 
push this one such that when WSE2 is on top, it go the AA side become dark and AB side become bright. So this is their interpretation. As a result, there is a large in-plane in strain. So that is uh, what I have observed, okay? But I want to say, well, but why we see the two different, right? You cannot just say, well, one on top of the other, then you, you just see different results until I look at this one and I say, well, this is really a more super lattice upside down, right? If when I take their result, this one, AA is when you have a large interlayer spacing, but the strain pushed this one down. Now, in our case, what we observe, okay, what we observe is we have MOS2 on top. So if I take their result, but say, well, instead of viewing from the WSE2 side, my STM look at it from WS2 side, then indeed, right, AA side, you have a large interlayer spacing, then you're going to see the high point. The strain also push it high point. Okay, so that explain why the two work to STM work will have the contrast reversal, but that also provide a, so that puzzle is solved, but also provide us with a mean to explain why the intralayer exciton, the moray potential is so large. Because then in that case, the moray potential is not really dominated by this simple interlayer coupling. For the intralayer, it is dominated by this, strain relaxation within the unit cell. But I do want to say that, do want to say that this is the strain within a moray unit cell, the strain modulation within the moray unit cell. But within, but if you take the whole moray, it is still zero total strain. Okay, it's just one goes, one region goes to the positive, one goes to the negative. But that is enough to give rise to a very large intralayer. Uh, more potential. And that explained our result. And then we reproduce that strain relaxation using a, 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 a simulation that, and now we are incorporated this, uh, the, the, the strain effect that calculates strain, try to incorporate it to incorporate the deformation potential. And I believe the, the result is very, it can explain what we observe in a high more potential uh, at that for the intralayer exciton. So this is sort of the case. Now, suddenly we use this systematic uh, variation because now we can create a very large ensemble and can map out this. So this is a hundred of, you know, just a few, just 10 fabrication. We can collect, we can have 200 more super lattice created that give rise to the reliability. And that we believe what we map out in terms of moray potential is much more precise. And this may be the first time that you can use this to, to access that information. And this is the part that I hope that you don't release, don't talk about this, at least within the next two months, all right? Because this hasn't been published. And I don't think I will have a time to to, to talk about the most recent work. And if you are interested in it, I will send you a preprint. So I will use just one, one minute to describe this. When we are talking about trying to create all of this uh, heterobilayer, and then you create, then the more potential is due to this geometric interference, right? That give rise to this potential modulation. But in the point where you are, we have uh, high interest is in this KK uh, coupling. The KK coupling, it is inherently very weak because of the orbital orientation. So what this work we have done is to use a hydrostatic pressure, put them in a diamond cell, then we can change the interlayer spacing. By doing so, we can change the KK coupling by almost a factor of three. So I will end it right here and then give you the, uh, the dis, you know, to show you who are the people who contribute to the talk that I have given. These are the people. And, but they are also, so Wen Hao is the, the one uh, did this uh, 
map out this inter and intralayer uh, moray potential. And Lance Lee, many of you know, uh, who is very, you know, who is very creative uh, in this 2D, uh, CVD growth of 2D electronic material. And, and then I should also show you other students that involve in 2D material. This, unfortunately, I don't have the time to talk about their work. And some of them just finished. They are now, they all go into a very good place. And Menka is on her way to Harvard. And I'm getting, so, and also uh, my colleague and many of my optical uh, Moray Exoton work have been collaborating with Elaine, except that nature paper. I don't want to get involved between Elaine and, and Xiaodong. <laughs> All right. And also Alan McDonald has, of course, big name in this uh, Moray business. And Feliciano uh, is our new colleague doing the DFT calculation. So thank you. Sorry that I get overboard. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, any questions you can put to chat or you can also raise your hand so uh, we know uh, that you have a question. You can click the reaction and raise your hand. So, so we already uh, have one. Jesus? Yeah. Uh, Jesus, yes, please. Yeah, so, so thank you very much, very nice talk. Uh, I, I had two questions. The first is uh, from someone who is not a specialist of STM. Uh, would mm -hmm. it be possible with uh, spin resolved STM to, to have access to the spin polarization of the, of the sites in the Moiré? In principle, there should be some spin valley uh, similar to spin valley locking in each Moiré site. Would it be possible to access it with uh, spin polarized STM? Good question. Indeed, and one of the very interesting part is this strong spin orbit coupling, right? Yeah. And then supposedly then you will like, for example, I think if you create some kind of uh, defect state, okay? And the defect state, you know, that if you populate a defect state with single electron, that I could create a Zeeman field. Oh. And that actually also impact that spin orbital uh, splitting between in the K and K prime valley. So, so you, can, you can try, I think, I think there are a lot of room to do this. The issue is of course, you can either create a, uh, create a magnetic defect in, the, in this material, or you can create this kind of moray structure then you can gate it. Okay, you can gate it and you can populate it exactly half filling, then what happened? Right. So there are a few groups that can, that I would say, uh, I think Chromie at, the, at, the, at Berkeley is in a very good position to do that. The other one is Apai, uh, uh, Pasusume, uh, Pasupate at the Columbia. Mm -hmm. they, they all can do this device work because they have a big team to help them to fabricate device. And, um, and uh, Mike has Feng Wang, you know, who is a very creative physicist. And we are on our process to acquire such a capability. So if you can do this, then you can kind of create those, those uh, state and in the flat band, you can have half fill. Yeah. When you have half fill, then what happened? And if you can also combine spin polarized STM to look at it. That would be very interesting. And I think the other group, in my opinion, in terms of the STM capability that closes to tackle this type of problem, probably Ali Yastani. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, okay. yeah. Uh, and I had a second question. Uh, I'm, yes, sure, uh, yes. I, I, I'm sure Jerry Tassoff has explained it, but. And do you understand why in your uh, lateral heterostructures, the strain distribution is um, uh, different in each of the two layers? So I had the impression that uh, uh, the, the strain uh, distribution or the strain inhomogeneity in one of the two TMDs was much larger in terms of a spatial scale. You mean the in, the, in this strain? Yeah, when you when you show when you see the misfit dislocations and uh, 
you measure the strain with the moiré. Yeah. So I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. next. I think it's the next slide, uh, number twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Use, yeah. Yeah, so 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 the the supposedly the strain should be should be the remember when we use the moray, our spatial resolution is about five nanometer, okay? Because we are limited by our moray periodicity, right? Five nanometer is our spatial resolution. So with by the time we get to close to the interface, if you track that, you only have a strain about two percent. What happened to the other two percent? Yeah. Well, the other 2% is really relaxed because remember when we are doing this in the Moray pattern right here, that we measure the Moray pattern in this region is because here you have misfit dislocation and that misfit dislocation relaxed that strain. So right here, when we, when we have this type of, we indeed we, this part will be about 4% strain. But once you move to about, five to 10 nanometer away, maybe only, yeah, maybe only five nanometer away, mm -hmm. the strain already reduced to 2%. And then if we count, say, well, how can the strain release so fast? Yeah, that's then we the count the number of the, a number of this, uh, this absorbe, and we just assume those are the number, those are where missed dislocation are, that turns out the number come out right. Okay. So, yeah. So that is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, okay, uh, thank Alexander. You. you have a question. Please go ahead. Thank you for the nice talk. I have very naive uh, basic question. Uh, so usually more uh, pattern is done when you put a single layer on top of uh, another material. But what if one puts say two layers, three layer, and then say observe uh, PFM images? Uh, would how, how they would transit? They disappear. Uh, abruptly or they would be slowly uh, well, changing you, you you can if you randomly put them they, they they disappear right but then the one of the the hot topic currently is so-called trilayer graphene so in the so-called trilayer graphene is this turns out trilayer graphene has much better property than the bilayer graphene so you you take this you, you twist this uh, one bilayer graphene and the bilayer graphene, once you twist, you're going to get this twist angle disorder. Very bad. In fact, you know, how did they even observe that uh, that my insulator stay in superconductivity is beyond me? Okay. Right. Because if you twist it and then, then tiny little perturb, because the magic angle is only one degree, right? So tiny little perturbation is going to give you a big change in the moray periodicity. What they have found is if you take this twist by layer, you, you do this, and then to do STM on the twist by layer is hard because when you anneal this thing in UHP, they slip. And so usually you put another layer of, uh, of HBN to seal it. But if you do the trilayer graphene, very interesting is you take this one, you turn it theta, but you turn back minus theta, the third layer. So the top and bottom is now zero. Turns out after you anneal it, the top and bottom align extremely well. So that actually make this moray pattern fabrication for trilayers much more beautiful. As it turns out, the superconductivity, okay, for this, uh, for this uh, trilayer uh, graphene, the TCs go even higher. So this is one of the hot topic uh, this year in the March meeting. Uh, if you're interested in it, I can, I can, you can send me an email. I can tell you where you can find the reference. So, so these are the so-called, you, you twist them and twist back this kind of a double twist, but it's sort of compensating twist. Then it turns out your Mori pattern created this, is in fact much better and much better, better quality. Now, there is also another, another uh, people talk about, you, you can, if you twist and then you accumulate a twist angle, the second, third layer, you accumulate that. If you can do them perfectly, you turns out you amplify the Moray potential amplitude too. If you can do them perfectly, but I doubt you can do them perfectly well. So uh, I hope I, I answer that question. Uh, if you try to keep, do a continuous twist angle and try to make the same angle. 
I think technically very difficult, but turns out if you try to twist it back, the third one, that turns out make the Mori pattern much better. So uh, that's a pretty... Maybe uh, what I was really, uh, this is very uh, interesting uh, comment, but what I really uh, wanted uh, was much more naive. If you say exfoliate exactly by layer, like in your unpublished work, when you have a different uh -huh. distribution, and then you naturally have perfect uh, by layer on top, sitting on another layer of another material. Yes, that has this kind of twist by layer that has been studied also in the, I, uh, I, uh, Pasupathy had a paper published in PNAS on this topic, like you, by layer and then by layer twist. So it's also very interesting. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of interesting topological uh, uh, property. And I have to say that I cannot claim that I understand them very well, uh, but I do know I'm aware of the work. If you are interested, I'll send you this call by layer by layer twist. Uh -huh. Great, great. I will uh, write you an email. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Shi, for the wonderful talk. Let's, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, so, so, so I don't want to host most of the audience. So let's, uh, let's, uh, um, let's thank uh, Professor Shi again. So if you are interested to ask questions, please stay. And uh, continue to ask uh, questions. I hope you don't mind, Professor Shi, to answer them. Uh, I don't mind at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. So uh, feel, please feel free to leave. And uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, stay, OK? Uh, because I also have some questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so. I ha I don't I haven't seen